Good morning and welcome to the 20th meeting of the committee in 2018. This is the committee's last meeting before the summer recess. Uh, we have apologies from Claire Baker, MSP today, and Neil Finlay, MSP, will be attending the committee as Claire's substitute. Uh, I understand that Neil has another appointment and he'll be arriving uh, later in the course of our meeting. Uh, we've also received apologies from Mary Goujon and Tavish Scott will be slightly late. Uh, our first item of business today is a decision on taking item three in private. Are members agreed? Agreed. Yes. Um, Our second item of business today is an evidence session from two separate panels uh, on STV's strategic review. The committee will take evidence on this issue from the relevant trade unions and then from Ofcom. And I'd like to welcome our first panel of witnesses today from the National Union of Journalists, Michelle Stanistreet, the General Secretary, and John Toner, the Scottish <laughs> Organiser, and also Paul McManus, uh, Scotland Negotiations <coughs> Officer, uh, from the Broadcasting, Entertainment, Communications and Theatre Union, that's back to for most of us. Uh, thank you very much for coming today and I'd like to invite Paul McManus to make an opening statement. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you very much to the committee for inviting us along today to, uh, to make a submission. In making the submission, we outline the three elements that STV have put forward as part of their strategic review, but I think it's worth highlighting before we jump to the effect of those uh, three elements it's worth highlighting that STV is a commercial organization so it's always about the money and over the past two or three years STV has fallen short of its 20 million pound annual profit target by around two million pounds a year and then discussions with STV management over the past few years, that point has not been lost on us and it has been a significant issue for the management of STV over the past two or three years. So that, to my mind, puts the cuts that are being proposed by STV just now into a bit more context. And when you start to add up the effect of the cuts that they're implementing just now, I think I certainly won't be surprised if perhaps not this year, but next year, they, they go through the magic 20 million pound uh, barrier, or what has been a barrier to them recently. So when our members are concerned about the rationale for the cuts and the changes that STV are implementing and how they don't make sense to the members, or some of them don't make sense to the members, we have to remind them that effectively this is a financial exercise. It's not about improving the operational side of the business, it's about improving the finances of the, of the business. Indeed, STV say some of the cost saving is attributed towards increased investment in programming, but the bulk of that programming will come from commissions, from other broadcasters and from other agencies. It won't be, in our view, net investment from STV. An investment in terms of the staff is probably our biggest area of concern here. Yes, some jobs have been created in the new productions unit. However, high end, highly trained, highly skilled, highly loyal craft and technical staff are essentially being discarded by STV for no other reason than to save money. Now, these staff, the bulk of them in their 40s and 50s, have spent many years loyalty towards STV, and we would have expected that some of that loyalty would have been repaid by STV investing in skills development and retraining. Their line has essentially been, we're not willing to invest the time or effort in retraining these staff. Now, BEC2 has never been opposed to the introduction of new technology or the benefits of new technology. And indeed, we do see many benefits from new technology. What we are opposed to is the inequality where crafts and technical staff are denied the opportunity to retrain into those areas. So that has created a great deal of fear resentment and anger amongst the staff. And I say fear because the staff who are leaving, the staff who are not being given the opportunity to retrain and reskill are quite rightly angry and frustrated. But it leaves a sense of fear for those who are left behind. Fear from people who are saying, well, I don't particularly want to take on these skills. I don't particularly have the skills to do these new roles. But it's either that or I lose my job. So all round the, the management 
the way in which this process will be managed, the treatment of the staff contradicts any ethos of fair work that the Scottish Parliament is trying to produce across the Scottish economy. And we would suggest that, you know, hopefully the committee will agree with us that STV should be roundly condemned for uh, the way in which it's treated its staff throughout this process. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Mr McManus. Um, we had um, the Chief Executive of STV uh, along to give evidence to us on the strategic review a couple of weeks ago, and he accepted that they were cutting a million pounds out of the news service, but you've, you'll have heard his evidence in which he said that there would be a better news service afterwards. I wonder if you would care to reflect on that? I think that's patently untrue. You can't remove the amount of staff and the quality of staff that they're removing and deliver a better service. I, uh, you know, we go back to the, the tried and tested phrases of working smarter. It doesn't prove to be true in this case. Yes, a number of the, the, the news, there is a reduction in the news because of the loss of STV2. Uh, as I say, Mr. Bishop, I've got no doubt they'll still meet their regulatory requirements. But whenever any broadcaster removes high end, highly skilled craft and technical staff from the, the news gathering process, quality suffers. So, by his own admission, quantity is suffering, and we would argue very strongly that quality will suffer. Staff will be, the remaining staff will be overstretched, overworked, unable to, to deliver a quality service. Thank you. I wonder if the NUG would like to respond to that question as well. I think that's absolutely right, that it's inevitable um, when the, the, the quantity of the, the news offering um, that's going to be there is diminished. It's inevitable that the, the, the breadth of diversity and scope and quality of that news provision is also going to be diminished, and our members are deeply concerned about that. Um, the, the, the quality and breadth and distinct local nature of a lot of that news provision is, is a really important element and unique selling point of what STV has to offer and we fear that that's going to be very badly compromised in the future. Thank you. Uh, I'll go to Stuart McMillan now. <coughs> Thank you, convener. Um, I think uh, both uh, your organisations uh, have got quite a number of staff at uh, STV. Now, the NUJ, I believe that you, you did a ballot of your members, is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And back to, um, I believe that you didn't do a ballot of your members, is that correct? That's correct, yes. Um, can you provide some, with some background as to why that decision was taken, please? Absolutely. Uh, back to policy is that whenever management bring forward, bring forward proposals for any kind of changes, then we will negotiate our way through those proposals. Uh, yeah, uh, we will, they expect us to leave no stone unturned in arriving at a negotiated settlement to any issue. And if, and only if at the end of that process we have members facing compulsory redundancy, then we will ask our members for the authority to ballot for industrial action at that point. It, it's our view that that's the, the best way to do things. Okay. Um, certainly, when you were having discussions uh, with your members, providing them with updates as to what was going on, was there ever a feeling that your members actually wanted to have a ballot for industrial action? No. The, well, in the event that anybody, any of our members are facing compulsory action, they took the decision very, very earlier on. If, at the end of this process, any of our members face compulsory redundancies, then we expect you to come back to us and, and tell us that you're starting a ballot for industrial action. However, through the early stages, it was get in there and negotiate and try and arrive at an, an agreed settlement for this. Okay. Uh, in terms of the NUJ, um, obviously you had your ballot. What was the, the turnout again for your ballot? The turnout was um, 81 members voted out of a total of 99. Mm. Uh, and, and did they all uh, vote for industrial action? 80 voted in favour and one voted against. That's pretty conclusive then. Yes. Okay. Um, the second question, well, second area is just on. I heard on the radio at the weekend that apparently. Uh, Crystal Amber have increased their, their stake uh, in STV um, by I think it's about 18% now. Uh, do you have any, uh, any comments you'd like to, uh, to put on the record about that? Do you think that is that a positive thing, in your opinion, or uh, is that a negative uh, issue? I think it's difficult to see that as a positive thing. Our, our members have been concerned about the presence of Crystal Amber right from the outset, right from the, from the day that their name was mentioned because of the type of organisation that they are. I think it's also very fair to say that there is a, a prevalent fear and concern that this whole exercise, the way in which it's been 
cat-candid and badly managed and, and poorly implemented is seen by many people as well as a prelude to a period in which STV will be on the market and you know we'll see a sale and a loss of a, a distinctive Scottish focused broadcaster national broadcaster and it's whilst the company is has told you all that that's not in their plans and that's not the motivation behind this that that hasn't made those fears and those concerns go away i think in terms of uh, crystal amber the their reputation is well known they believe they can fatten companies up and, and increase their financial effectiveness so i think the uh, go back to the financial arguments I, I made financial comments i made at the start of my submission I, uh, I think it's a sign that Chris Lambert see the companies going in the right way financially from their point of view, and it makes it more attractive for them to get involved. I don't think our members see it as a particularly positive gesture. At the same point, we have to remember you know, that Simon Pitts has given us assurances that he's got no intention of, of fattening the company up for sale. However, we reminded them that our members at Grampy and TV were told that for a great many years, up until the day that the shareholders decided to take the money and run. So, that you know, uh, in a commercial environment, uh, staff can have no faith about any reassurances about the company not being for sale. It's a fact of life in commercial broadcasting. Mm. Well, I think that, that also goes back to your opening comment, Mr. McManus, that uh, the STV is a, it's a commercial operation. Absolutely. Yes, and, and I'd say it's been it's weighed heavily on them that they haven't hit their twenty million pound targets over the past two or three years. So, you know, I, 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 there can be no reassurances. It's it's something that you you have to live with in a commercial environment. That at any point the shareholders can say, right, fine, we're off. We'll take the money and go. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, Ross Green. Thank you, convener. Um, I refer members to my register of interests. I'm a member of the NUJ. Um, I would like to ask about the process around redundancies. There's been some, not confusion so far, but two quite contradictory versions of events, one from the staff, from your members, and one from senior management around how staff were informed of potential redundancies. So we heard uh, through yourself, through your submission, uh, and I've certainly heard uh, informally from individuals that staff were informed their jobs would be safe and then informed that they weren't, that some members of staff were informed that they were facing uh, comp potential compulsory redundancy minutes before a live broadcast. Uh, the senior management's version of events seemed to be quite different from what staff were saying. I was wondering if you could detail your understanding of how staff have been informed of this process so far. <clears throat> Initially, the, the company called staff to one-to-one -to -one meetings <clears throat> to tell them whether they were, or to be more, to tell them whether their post was at risk or not, and explain the process to them. They initially um, opened up to, to receiving applications for voluntary redundancies. Management made it quite clear to us from the start that they didn't believe the, the voluntary process would achieve the number of redundancies that they, they needed and that they believed that at some point it would be necessary to move to compulsory redundancies. Now, as you say, Staff have been told contradictory things um, at, at different points. My, my, my view of this whole process is that nor normally when a company embarks on a consultation, it already has its restructure set out. They've, they've designed the restructure. They know what the end result is going to be before they embark on consulting about redundancies. With this process, I, th I think it's fair to say that on a weekly basis, we haven't, we haven't had a clear picture of how the, the new structure would look. So that, in my, in my view, the company has embarked on the consultation process without having its final plans firmly established. Um, what you say is accurate that information given to staff has changed. I, I know of one member of staff who was told her Job was her job was disappearing. She could apply for voluntary redundancy or she could apply for some of the posts that were going to be vacant. And she decided to go for the latter. Changed her mind a bit further on, decided to go for voluntary, and was told at that point, well, actually, we don't want to make you redundant anymore. Um, we want you to stay. And that's not untypical of some of the things that have happened to stuff. 
if, if, if that... If you want to ask me more, I'll tell you more. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, no, that, that's very <coughs> useful. Thanks, John. Um, I was wondering, given that we've had the news of there, now, there are no planned compulsory redundancies now with editorial staff, um, where you think uh, the, the cuts will now fall, is, is this because enough voluntary redundancies have been agreed to, or is it because the company now has, has identified, I think that's particularly relevant for, for BEC2 members, has identified other areas in which they can make the compulsory redundancies and the savings that they're make, uh, looking to make? Well, I think, I think one of the things, if I can just pick up on your, your earlier question as, as well, I, uh, there, are, there are two ways to do a redundancy consultation. You can give the trade unions and the staff a detailed set of plans and say, that's it, you know, we're ready to consult on it now, in, in which case most of the staff and the trade unions go, well, that's great, you presented us with a fait accompli, so where do we go from here? Or the management can come to you, and in this instance, STV explained to us that they decided that they would come to us and say, well, here's what it kind of feels like, but we want to talk to you about it. And equally, rather than calling an all-staff meeting and saying, here's the people who are at risk of redundancy, they elected to get into one-to-ones to say to individuals, your post is, is potentially at risk of redundancy. And they explained to us that from previous experience, a number of staff affected by, by such proposals said, I don't want to sit in an all-staff meeting and hear that my job's at risk. You should be talking to me one-to-one. -one. So from my perspective, my faith is placed in, in the trade union management consultation process. There are different ways for management to present their proposals to staff. And, and, and it's, you know, it is easy to, to sit back and, and nitpick and be negative about it. I prefer management coming to us with some flexibility to say, well, here's what it feels like. What do you think? Because we are talking about people's jobs and I want to know or I want to be able to believe that getting into a consultation process, I can put forward alternative suggestions that, that they may say, well, OK, right, we'll go down that route and, and not make that person redundant. Now, anybody affected, is it's a stressful period for them, but from my experience, members would rather us being able to come back to them and say, right, OK, I know you were targeted for redundancy, but we've actually managed to sort something out for you. I'd prefer to have that than not having any flexibility in management at all. That does open management up then to the, the critique that, well, you don't know what you're doing. But it, it, it's kind of, you know, it, it depends which side of the fence you're on. I would suspect between the two set of scenarios you described in your initial question, the truth is somewhere in the middle. Yes, they made mistakes. Yes, they didn't get it right. Everybody got told. The one thing I, I feel they fell down on was they didn't give people written detail. People were told in individual meetings what they suspected was happening. Staff were given briefings, been shown nice PowerPoint presentations, but there was never any bits of paper that people could hang their hats on and say, right, it's five of these and it's one of this and it's six of those. Our members were coming to us saying, well, I was told it was three. And somebody else said, no, no, he said four. So the feedback coming back in the absence of bits of paper was was a bit contradictory. I, uh, I, and, and I think that, I, uh, again, it is the bulk of our members who are facing redundancy. Nobody's out of the woods yet. As I said in opening submission, if people turn around and say, well, we're not taking on the new skills, then they put themselves in, in the firing line. My, my point comes back to the, you know, the lack of investment in training and skills development for the people. There's a... Uh, I don't believe there's any need for any compulsory redundancies. That's the point we were making with STV. They have we have negotiated changes to their proposals. We have reduced the number of people affected. We have found alternative work for the number of people affected, and that is a positive thing. But STV need to do more to meet us in the middle so that we can avoid compulsory redundancies. I, I would add, I mean, flexibility is important in, in any process like this, of course, but it's not a situation in which you're faced with a company who's um, facing a major financial crisis and feels the need that, you know, they have to act really swiftly to, to ram through changes or else face, face severe consequences. And I think it's really unfortunate with this process that... Uh, a, a more reasonable, rational and um, considered view wasn't taken from the outset to meaningfully engage with staff about their plan to bake these cuts and to have a serious amount of time to be able to do that. The whole process from start to finish, from the announcement of a review in March to the point in which they an announced what the scale of those cuts would be, has been carried out, I think, with unseemly haste. And it's, 
it's not quite a fait accompli, but it's, pr it's pretty much that. And if you don't have the time to meaningfully engage and consult, and you're told at the outset it's only going to be a 30-day consultation process, which, which I think is a pretty bargain basement employer approach to take when you're talking about people's futures and livelihoods, it's very difficult you know, for, for members to take other than a, a defensive position and try and protect the position against compulsory redundancies, which was the reason we balloted when we did. Um, and it, in ordinary circumstances, circumstances that shouldn't be a, a, a consideration we should have to make in a collective bargaining process it should be more grown up it should be more engaged there should be opportunities for staff and members to feed through alternatives and other ideas and, 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 and change and inform that process um, and in the course of this process inevitably you get volunteers flooding because a lot of people are very unhappy about the state of the company at the moment and don't want to don't want to stay there they feel that they've been treated really shabbily and I understand that and none of that, to me, is befitting of a national broadcaster. I think, in retrospect, there's been a lot of mistakes made, and I would hope that the company learns from that because, yes, the shareholders are a priority for any commercial entity, but their staff should be their fundamental priority, and, and it's their passion and loyalty and commitment to those roles that makes STV what it is, and, and I hope that the tone and the engagement with the unions and their staff changes in the coming period. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Richard Lockhead. <coughs> Thank you. In the two or three weeks since we've heard from Simon Pitts, I'm sure there's been further talks, and he referred to that happening. I just wondered if you can give the committee an update on what the outcome of any further talks has been. Yes, the, uh, the, the consultation period the initial consultation period effectively ends tomorrow. I, uh, the trial for voluntary redundancies has closed. Uh, there have been a continuing number of reductions in the number of people at risk, but there are some uh, two or three selection processes going on just now for uh, staff affected by the proposals. I, uh, I, I, I have to emphasise, though, that, again, at the very first meeting with STV, while they set out their this is a period for voluntaries, this is a period for consultations. We said to them, well, you're talking about the end of the year for most of these posts and changes to take effect. So we'll be talking for the rest of the year about this at the very least. And they went, absolutely. You know, we've set out our initial stall, but we'll talk for as long as it takes. So, you know, and, and, and equally the trial for volunteers, we have to have a cut-off date to try and establish how many we get in the first tranche. We've, we've gone through that process. And STV have now widened the process out because there are still some posts at risk. So we were we had discussions with STV this week about staff from other potential areas who might be interested or who are interested in voluntary redundancy that may allow redeployment and retraining opportunities. So the, again, there's the, there's the two elements to it. The, the STV2 closure has some very defined timelines as to when programmes finish work through right through to December. So we're kind of got arbitrary dates there to try and uh, address the issues for those staff. We're currently looking at the staff with August and December dates. Uh, yeah. and I'll, Some of them, I've been told this morning, are, are you know now being moved into the new productions unit. The, the craft and technical staff, uh, yeah. we are in a selection process for a couple of them at the minute, but again, no post-closures are foreseen before the end of the year, so we will now be looking at the the, these volunteers from wider areas to see if there's redeployment opportunities and, and STV agreed with me yesterday that if a couple of the people in the wider areas do put, them, do put their hands up they would offer potential redeployment for affected staff. So we're kind of in individual discussions about individuals with STV on an ongoing basis but the numbers you know, do keep coming down. Thanks. There are clearly different perspectives on the modernisation agenda. And I raised with the chief executive the impact on news reporting in STV North area, because clearly I represent the constituency in the north of Scotland, and the reduction of staff there and the potential impact on reflecting diversity and maintaining quality and also coping with the geographical and indeed weather challenges you sometimes have in uh, that large part of the country. And of course, the response was that there's actually going to be more cameras, there'll be video journalists, et cetera, et cetera. What's your view of that? I know there were initially some you know, reservations that that cannot maintain the same kind of quality of reporting, but is that something you think you can hold back? Well, let me, let me, I can come in at this point. 
One of the, one of the examples that you were, you were given by Steve even management where um, multimedia journalism has worked very well was BBC Wales. And they quoted a figure of 200 journalists retrained as video journalists. Now, we've checked up on that. And there's something not quite right about that figure. One of our members has actually suggested that a zero might have been added accidentally somewhere along the line, but it's nowhere near 200. And we've got conflicting reports from our members about how well that works. Um, clearly, some of our members say that there are occasions when a craft camera is absolutely necessary and <coughs> makes the job much easier to do. On the other hand, there are some occasions when have, having the ability to, to self-shoot is advantageous. But overall, our, our view is that <coughs> Reducing the, num <coughs> excuse me, reducing the number of craft cameras, giving the, the actual journalist more tasks to perform, must have an impact on the quality of news gathering and the quality of news broadcast. Okay. I think as well it's worth bearing in mind that in their consultation process, STV identified to us that they are uh, keen to increase the audience figures amongst the younger generations, which, funnily enough, was already a year younger than me, which was quite insulting. But anyway, I, uh, STV felt that the younger generation, quite rightly, I would agree, I, uh, don't generally sit down at tea time and watch the news or, you know, come in from school and watch the news. They're quite happy to watch mobile phone footage on their tablets or phones or, or iPads or whatever. And therefore, they felt that uh, less craft skills were required to deliver that kind of footage to the to the younger generation. So there's there's an expectation, a belief within STV that you know the quality is not the, the paramount issue. Uh, yeah. Certainly in terms of the, the north, there's been a reduction, there's significant reduction in, in the Western Isles, there's significant reduction of craft skills across the north of Scotland. Uh, yeah. And I've got absolutely no doubt that uh, yeah. quality will suffer and the quantity of, of coverage will, will suffer. Indeed, in one of the days we met with the STV, I was told that that morning in Aberdeen we had a situation where one video journalist was out filming another video journalist doing a story. So when STV say everybody will have a camera and the world will be wonderful, it's not a simple case that you've got all these extra cameras on the road. As John said, there will be occasions where you know, people will be doubling up. Indeed, STV said there might be occasions where there's three of them out at the one time doing the, covering the same story. So it's not as simple. We're going to get, you know, we're going to hand out 30 cameras and, and we're going to have tons more footage. Indeed, STV have said to themselves they want to reduce the number of stories that they, they shoot each day. Question? Yeah, which just reflect, it just relates to the um, bigger picture <coughs> debate, uh, which is the, the fact that you're in, your members are in the television industry. Uh, the media industry, and it is rapidly changing. And that's clearly one of the motivations for the proposals from the management. But I was just wondering, do you feel that your members have had adequate input into that debate about what should happen next and how we should adapt to, uh, you know, in the case of SDV, how the company should adapt to that changing agenda? And is there any lessons to learn in terms of going forward about how you can be better involved in that debate? So. I think that conversation is what we're about to happen next. Once the the jobs have been settled, we will we will be taking part in um, working groups about what the new setup should look like and how it should operate. So I can't say as yet we've had adequate um, consultation, but we hope that we will have by the by the time the process has ended. It would have made more sense to have that stage of a process before you got to the stage of the voluntary redundancy exercise and, and the cuts being implemented. Similarly, um, none of our members have ever been resistant to, to, to technical change or the challenges that that kind of creates in different ways, but it's about how that's implemented, how it's done properly, and making sure that if there are if there's training and reskilling that needs to happen, that that's done in an intelligent way and in a way that takes those people with them and gives people the opportunity to acquire those different skills at the same time as 
you know, still exploiting and using and valuing all of the skills and experience that they bring with them as long-serving members of staff and making that redeployment process work in a, in a fair and transparent way. So I think th there are some things that actually would be some, for, some earlier engagement on that might have helped the process and might have you know, served to, to lessen the impact that there's been on staff morale because certainly from our members, morale is at rock bottom at the moment and I think that's a really unfortunate consequence of the process and the handling of this to date. And I'd just add on, in terms of a, a broader concern that I would have, uh, you know, in reading the, the evidence from the company when you last met with them, is that there's a lot of focus on, you know, the future visions. There's, there's always a lot of guff spoken about visions in these kind of situations. Um, but it's very much kind of the focus was on drama and, you know, that side of the business, which is really important, very important part of it. But equally, so is news and current affairs. And it, it felt quite light in its focus in that regard and, and we would have concerns about what is the future in that area you know is are the resources going to be sufficient technical changes and different ways of doing things are often seen by companies as a way of you know doing things more cheaply when actually to do those things properly and effectively and with maximum impact um, for everybody, for, for, for listeners and, and readers and viewers as well, is, that, is, to, is to do that with proper resources, you know, which requires real investment, not, not a kind of a movement around of existing resources. You need those people and you need those skills. I think in, in, in terms of your, your question, I, was actually, I would actually go one stage further. I think the two exercises should be completely divorced because the debate about the benefits of new technology is one that we have with other broadcasters and, and I've had with STV in the past, when it's connected to we need to save some money so we're going to chuck everybody a wee cheap camera, there's quite an understandable level of scepticism that this isn't about achieving the benefits of new technology, it's about saving money. You know, and, and as Michelle said, with the proper training and skills and, and you know, upskilling and investment in it, then you can get benefits from new technology. Uh, yeah. So I think uh, they should have had that conversation uh, in a different time and a different place. And, and, you know, in STV were quick, as John says, to quote BBC Wales. They neglected to, to do any comparisons with BBC Scotland, where since the concept of a new channel was, was announced, BBC Scotland has engaged it in detailed and regular discussions with us about the balance. The headlines were 80 new journalism posts, but BBC Scotland was sitting down with us saying, right, well, how many of these posts should we craft? What should these people be doing? What skills should we give them? What skills should they have? You know, where should the balance be? And those, those discussions are, are ongoing. And indeed, BBC Scotland uh, is in the process of, of advertising for a, a, you know, a considerable number of uh, craft journalism posts with the, the BBC's terminology these days, everybody's classed as journalism. And, and I think, you know, an awful lot of people say, you know, just say, right, well, that's a journalist. You know, uh, you, know you can be a craft editor and be called a journalist these days. Uh, yeah. So uh, yeah, we have those ongoing conversations with the BBC and, and, and they will continue. And, and STV should have taken a leaf out of their book and sat down with us and said, right, we want to use more of these cameras because the BBC and others have tried that type of exercise before where they just chuck cameras at people and it's failed miserably. You know, where there's an intelligent debate, again, as Michelle says, then we tend to, everybody tends to benefit from it better and the staff are more engaged in the process like that. Thanks. Thank you, Alexander Stewart. Thank you. I mean, it, it's quite apparent that much of the success of STV is down to the workforce. The, the loyalty of the workforce, the, the skill base you have, uh, the total professionalism that's been shown uh, over the years, uh, and also you're, you've been not unflexible about changing and moving things forward. Uh, and when we had the chief executive, I, mean, I, I said to him here that it, this was a public relations disaster for STV, but it's a bigger disaster for your members uh, in this whole process. Now, we, we've touched today on uh, the redeployment and retraining uh, and, and giving individuals that opportunity. Uh, can you maybe just elaborate how that whole process is working and has worked so far? Because I still get the feeling that there are some people who obviously have morale at, lock, at rock bottom level because they have just been discarded in this whole process. Well, the, the closure of STV is, is the first example of, of what you're asking about. Uh, as soon as Simon Pitts came in and the review was, was you know, initiated, it was expected that the closure of STV2 would, would be announced at some point. It's losing 800,000 a year. Uh, audience figures aren't great. Now, the previous chief executive felt he could go on building that service up and, and make it profitable. 
But since Simon Pitt's arrival, it became clear through the review it, it was likely to, to close. Now, within STV2, there, there are uh, journalism jobs associated to the additional uh, news output, but the majority of staff are in uh, production areas. And they've come in over the past three or four years through the local TV franchise. Uh, yeah. Some of them, the, the minute they heard the, the announcement of the review and the outcome of the review and were told that the posts were at risk, went, well, but there are new jobs coming, but you've just, you know, there was no conversation about how you might keep me in the company. It was simply, your post is at risk, and further down the road, we're not quite sure when, there may be new jobs. Now, some of those staff went, well, if that's your attitude, we're off, we'll just go at the end of June. Uh, yeah. Some staff were asked to stay on longer and said, no, we're off at the end of June. And again, we said to STV, you should have been coming to the table to those production staff saying there will be production jobs, here's what they look like, and we would be very keen for you to move forward. Now, that's kind of what's happened in practice, is management have been talking to me, saying, right, well, you've got, you know, you've got people here affected by the closure of STV2, there's jobs here, we really hope they apply for them. And, and some of those people have been successful in getting jobs. But if it had been managed slightly more proactively to begin with, they wouldn't have been put through that, that unnecessary stress. There, there are other people currently who are sitting there who, as, as I say, uh, you know, STV reinforced at a meeting last week, they looked me straight in the face and said, no, Paul, we're not going to offer any retraining or skills development to those people. They're at risk. If they don't find something else that suits their particular skills, then they're gone. You know, so there have been, again, different responses and different approaches from STV in either way, and that's why, going back to my earlier point, we've kind of had to work through it job by job to try and arrive at a solution that works for everybody. I'd also like to confirm that there are, there are people who are simply going because they find a, a job elsewhere. People have been leaving without any um, redundancy package. You'll understand why that's happening. You've got one major broadcaster announcing a redundancy programme and another major broadcaster 200 metres down the road with, with 80 jobs to fill. And as Paul just said, where, where, do I, where do I go for a job? There's a job being advertised down the road. I'm going to apply for that now because it may not be there in a month's time. So you'll understand why people are saying, I've had enough of what's happening here. I'm going to apply for a job at BBC. Exactly what you've entailed uh, is that putting people in that difficult position where they, where they have no real security uh, for their retraining or redeployment, uh, then it's a much easier option for STV for them to go. Uh, because then STV don't have to bother about having to manage that situation for them. They've made their own choice, uh, uh, and it, it may be because <laughs> they have no other option but to make that choice. So, so do you think that that, that was a, a, a plan by STV to try and force that situation on individuals? No, I, I have to say I think it's, uh, from the highest levels of STV, it's been an absolute disregard and a, and a lack of commitment towards the, the, the staff. There are people... Uh, some of the people affected by these proposals who are currently going through a selection process are in their early 60s, cannot afford to lose their jobs, are sitting there with STV saying, we're not going to put any time or money into, into retraining you. They have the skills to do the jobs, and where the BBC and other broadcasters have taken a, a more positive approach, then the feedback from the broadcasters has, has been really positive about, you know, either... Journalism staff taking on craft skills, craft staff taking on journalism skills, particularly at the older age groups, perhaps when you get to that level, you feel, I have to be willing to learn. But there has you know, been very little negative feedback about it. STV, and it's not the first time there have been, you know, throughout the whole you know, new technology, the introduction of video journalism and all types of other new technology, STV has steadfastly refused to invest in, in training those people. So it, it's a kind of corp it's a corporate... So, it's a damning corporate yeah, failure, it, it, in my it, view. It, it, it's a failure for corporate to ensure that, that the staff are put in that untenable situation, uh, that they have no other options but to accept things outside or to accept what's been given to them inside, uh, because they, they, don't, they don't necessarily have the options that are open to them to move. I, I would really hesitate before saying that that was intentional. I know that there are staff leaving STV that they don't want to lose. No. 
but they but, but they may, may still be losing them because of the because yeah. of their behaviour, because of their their attitude, and because of what they're actually doing to individuals. Precisely, it doesn't really matter whether it's cock up or conspiracy. That is the effect of, exactly. of the actions that they have, you know, chosen to implement. It's it, it, it it's been it's been the wrong approach right from the get go. The fact that basic information like the you know the so-called re the report that was carried out, the DMA media report that is ostensibly at the heart of their future plan and strategy hasn't been shared. Why, why is that not being shared? I mean, that's basic information that should be seen as an important part of that process. If it's, if it's what they say it is, and which has led to their decision making, it should be a useful thing to back up their proposals and their future. And so not to share stuff like that and not to have meaningful conversations and dialogue with their unions and their staff about that is incredibly remiss. So to put people in a position of feeling that they have to jump in case they're pushed, you know, a month or so down the line, with no certainty about how long the, the, the formal consultation process will actually last, is, is not right. And it, it absolutely should not be the kind of behaviour of a broadcaster of note like SDV. I mean, as, as you say, that uh, an organisation... Okay. Next Sorry. member, if you Thank don't you. mind, uh, Jimmy Green. Thank you, Convener. <clears throat> Good morning, panel. <clears throat> I mean, there's been a lot of discussion here. I think... Um, it's absolutely right that there's uh, a huge amount of criticism uh, uh, with regards to SCV and how they've handled this process. And I think perhaps some of the concerns that the panel raises around the process, the communication, uh, the time periods, the consultation, just the general approach that's been taken by uh, new management within the organisation. But that being said, what we will get at the end of this is a, uh, a more modernised approach to news gathering and news delivery, which will deliver more output in terms of more original content production, uh, giving new skills to existing members of staff who previously did not have those digital skills, uh, increased in-house productions uh, in terms of setting up new, uh, uh, new development of content. So, you know, whilst it's difficult and it's right that we criticise STV, does, does the panel not accept that this modernisation had to happen eventually? You know, STV has been a dinosaur in modernisation of, of creating multimedia journalists uh, and it's probably one of the last major broadcasters in the UK to make that shift. Uh, is there not a, is this notwithstanding uh, the problems that, you, that you're bringing today, is there not an understanding and acceptance that this was bound to happen and it was never going to be easy? I, I have to say I, I, I don't accept that, no. I don't, I don't expect, accept that this is part of a modernisation process. STV embarked on multi-skilled journalists many years ago at the same time as, as the BBC and other broadcasters, and you know uh, we saw the disappearance of craft editors shortly after they, they took over Grampian TV when they introduced video journalism. And I would argue this is not about modernising the agenda, this is about increasing the use of multi-skilled roles to save money. I mean, STV have video journalists, the same, the same as every other broadcaster. They have multi-skilled roles, the same as every other broadcaster. This is a straightforward cost-saving exercise. Let's get rid of the older, more expensive craft staff, craft staff and let's hand, you know, more younger, cheaper people cameras so that it'll give us increased, increased coverage. By STV's own admission, their output is going to reduce. They have told us the amount of stories they film every day will reduce for, for the news. And yes... You know, in terms of production and programme making, they've told us they're going to invest money in that, and we hope that genuinely does turn out to be the case. But we, we, this, this isn't about modernising. STV and some of the technology they have introduced in recent years has been industry leading, and we have worked with them in the introduction of that technology. This is not about them being behind the times, this is about them saving money. Right, and, and to, to, to characterise STV and, and by inference, you know, staff and skills as being like a dinosaur, I don't, I don't accept. Um, and, and, and it is a you know, modernisation is one of those words that's used to mean lots of different things, isn't it? Particularly by companies to justify cost-cutting exercises that they're carrying out. I think you've got to look at actually what's going to be the outcome, and, and from our perspective, you know, what's going to be the outcome in terms of quality journalism and programming, quality news and current affairs, news that's diverse in its output, both geographically and in its depth. And, and we know already that there's going to be fewer stories, few, fewer pieces of original journalism and current affairs. Is that a good thing? I don't think so. Is that modernisation? It's not a particularly um, good form of modernisation, in my view. And to be able to embrace, um, 
you know, multi-platforms in the way that journalists do all the time, and journalists love getting their stories out. They don't care about the platform or how it's disseminated. They just want to be able to do their jobs properly. They want to make sure that the, their output, their work, is professional of and of a high standard, and and that's how you know they judge what works and what doesn't, and and, and what's befitting of a, a modern workforce or not. And can I just refer you to the to the written submission from the NUJ? where we say that STV News is one of the leading online news services in Scotland and has engagement levels and reach on social media beyond that of many of its competitors. That sounds to me like it's STV's competitors who need to modernise. Um, um, and, 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 and in regard yeah. to multi-skilling, how many skills can you train a worker to have before you accept that he can't possibly deploy all the skills in the course of 24 hours? I also found it quite insulting in listening to um, the chief executive speak about this because there was the sense of a narrative that somehow, you know, he's come in and, and STV has been lagging behind the industry in all of these different ways and he's dragging them, you know, into the, um, you know, the 21st century, which absolutely doesn't reflect <laughs> the workforce as we know it and the output, output as we know it. And I, and I don't think the optics of that coming in to, to a new team, your staff, and, and given that perspective of the way in which they work and the skills that they have, I, I think is a very bad look. Um, if I could just uh, clarify, um, for the record perhaps, that in no way was I referring to the staff as dinosaurs. Um, I, I actually share um, some of the deep-rooted concerns that many of them have, especially the on-air talent, uh, around this new concept that they will have to turn up at stories, drive themselves to the story, set up the camera, shoot themselves delivering the story, edit the package, do a broadcast version, a digital version, and then get back to to base again, and, and all this is going to be a seamless and an easy task. I know for a fact it's not. So I, I absolutely share uh, their concerns on that. Um, but there is a wider point here, and that is that STV does have to go where its audiences are, and audiences are shifting. Um, and if audiences are shifting to new forms of consumption of news through smaller bite-sized packages, produced, yes, on smaller cameras, but you know I have a camera in my office which shoots in 4K, uh, which is broadcast quality, so it doesn't mean it's cheaper and, and, and worse, it's just how technology is changing. How does the panel think that STV could, moving forward, meet the objectives of going where audiences are, but still maintain these really important craft skills that a lot of your members have? I think there's, there's, there's two different elements to that, and again, uh, you know, my four grown-up kids, I uh, rarely watch STV or BBC News, but they're frequently showing me news items that somebody has shot on their mobile phone, on their mobile phone. I, uh, so I, I recognise that, you know, we have to face that conundrum. If that's how the younger generation want to get their news, then can we really sit there and say, no, you can't do that, broadcasters, you must have a craft camera and a sound operator and a VT editor and a journalist on every story. No, we have to move with it. We have to move with the times and we have to accept that. Our concern is about how the staff are taken in that journey. And that's where, uh, you know, again, uh, STV have failed its craft and technical staff in that regard by simply abandoning them rather than taking them on the journey as other, as other broadcasters have done. So I think for me, it's more about working with the, the, the broadcasters and, and STV in particular to get the best benefits, potential benefits out of the new technology, but making sure that they take the staff with them in that journey rather than simply discarding them and, and hiring somebody else. One of the things that the management said when they were here was that they've, they've looked at what's happened to newspapers and they're trying not to repeat the mistakes made by newspaper companies, which, of course, I understand and respect them for trying to do that. But we would argue that the the year by year dwindling newspaper circulations is as a direct result of cutting staff and reducing the quality of newspapers so that the newspapers that you buy today are not as good as the newspapers you were buying ten years ago. That's I think that's the lesson that STV needs to learn from newspapers failures that cutting staff and cutting quality is not the way to preserve your broadcast company. You need to reach people in as many different media as possible, of course, but it's the quality that you deliver through each medium that is crucial to retaining your audience. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to move <coughs> on now to Neil Finlay, but before I invite you to ask a question, Mr Finlay, have you got any relevant interests to declare? Uh, none, convener, no. Thanks. Uh, 
How many are directly uh, uh, employed across the board, and what's the trade union density? We, our density increased um, the day the day we announced Shocker. that we were that we were balloting <laughs> our density, which is which is always a welcome aspect of having a ballot for action. We we currently have ninety nine members. We believe the total possible eligibility for NUG membership would be 110. So it's a, it's a huge density. Yeah. <clears throat> I believe that STV, going by their figures, have around just under 400 staff on, on some kind of permanent or uh, part-time contract. Uh, yeah. And I think between ourselves and, and the NUG, we're probably close to 50% of the staff in terms of density. Okay. Um, and is there a... Um, De deliberate um, move to get rid of staff who are higher paid? I, I believe so, yes. I, I think it's uh, uh, over a number of years ago we agreed a, a new paying grading system with STV which was benchmarked on, on market rates and a significant number of uh, our members in the high-end craft and, and technical areas, their salaries sat above those scales for historical reasons. Uh, and there have been discussions every year about annual pay rises and how we address those anomalies and uh, the, the anomalies, as STV call them. Uh, and, and the people who are being identified at risk of redundancy in the craft and technical areas are, are the top earners. They're, they're the highest salaries. Uh, yeah, they're, and as I say, you know, we believe there are other roles that those people can do. Uh, uh, there are other areas where changes could be made in STV you know, have, have specifically uh, targeted the, the craft cameras. I'm not, I'm not saying they've, they've picked on the individuals, it's just a fact of life that the craft cameras, the craft editors, a lot of the technical people are at the higher end of the salary scale. So when you say to us, well, we want to get rid of a craft camera and, you know, employ a younger person with a digital camera that's going to be multi-skilled, their salary is probably going to be less than half of the craft camera. So it's an inevitable outcome that high-end salaries yeah. are suffer. In relation yeah, to um, the, the voluntary redundancy terms that were offered would not be attractive to someone with only a few years service and on a low salary, but, but would be more attractive to someone with many years service and earning a high salary. So in you, relation, can draw, you can draw your own conclusion from in that. In relation to the journalists, um, <clears throat> is it the case that a large number of the newer journalists are, are employed on a salary lev level under twenty thousand pounds. There are there are mem members of ours work, working on those. Uh, uh, do you know the numbers? I think I don't. No. Okay. And finally, um, uh, uh, all of this um, multi-skilling that's been encouraged and demanded, has there been an analysis of analysis of the multi-skills and talents of the people who are the decision makers? <laughs> are they included in this multi multitasking, multi talented? New regime. They would probably argue that they're the epitome of a few <laughs> managers, but I better leave it there. They've handled this process so well, that's, that, that's clear. There certainly was talk that um, they might have to operate cameras if the NUG walked out. And <laughs> <laughs> God help us all. Um, I've got a couple of questions just to finish uh, for Michelle Stanis Street. Um, you mentioned in your Applies to Stuart McMillan earlier, uh, the fact that the STV was the last independent Channel 3 uh, in the UK. Could you say from an NUJ point of view what the effect has been of the loss of the independent Channel 3 provision across the UK as, it, as it's been subsumed into ITV? What's the effect been on jobs and quality of news journalism? Um. Well, that's probably been a, a varied picture throughout, really. Um, I, I mean, I, I think the fear for um, the future here is that um, it would be, you know, potentially on a pathway where there would be a loss of a, a very um, a focused national broadcaster here that brings uh, a distinct Scottish voice and a diversity that is so different from the rest of the UK, particularly in the context of current 
UK politics, international politics, there's a very different perspective here that, that if lost, would, would have even more of a significant impact or detriment compared to, you know, any, you know, any other changes that have taken place um, through ITV in the past to, to become effectively a region of ITV as opposed to what it is at the moment. Um, and, and that's the concerns for our members at the moment in terms of how they might see the short to medium term panning out, particularly when you're looking at it in the bigger, bigger picture of the movements that are happening in the broadcasting sector generally, what's going on with Sky at the moment, what's going on with Comcast and Disney and potential of a consolidation that's mo mooted in the short to medium term as well. What's that impact going to be here in Scotland and, and on STV? So I, I think inevitably when there's consolidation um, and changes of that type, then it's, it's you're embarking on a cost-cutting programme that in our experience from a journalistic perspective inevitably um, has a detrimental impact on the quality of the output and the diversity of the output on ever more um, less or ever less or rather increasingly less local and uh, coverage and less distinctive you know hubs that become broader and bigger and bigger to render them almost meaningless from a local perspective and I think that would be the real concern that we would have in our experience mm -hmm. elsewhere. Sure, can I, sorry can, yes, I just, can I just add in that I think one of the the key points that, that Michelle made there was in our experience is if you go around the communities that are served by Border, Time Tees, Yorkshire TV, they feel as they were you know, taken over by TV that they've lost their cultural identity. Mm -hmm. uh, those television stations don't reflect the cultural identities or cultural importances to the people of the, the regions of England. And indeed, you know, Richard may well be able to tell you how people in the north of Scotland feel about their cultural identity since Grampian was taken over by, by STV and that would again, as Michelle said, that would become further diluted by any kind of greater consolidation. Right, thank you. Do the proposed changes, well, do you expect them to have an effect on STV's ability to meet its uh, news programme uh, obligations as part of the Channel 3 licences? No, absolutely not. They'll, they'll still, they've said, stated to us they'll still exceed their licence obligations, and I've got absolutely no doubt to, to dispute that. They're, they're, they're dropping it back down, they're taking out the STV2 element and they will drop down so they're just in excess of the licence obligations. Okay. Where do you think Ofcom would have a role? At what point would that be triggered? If, if there was a quality threshold then they'd probably be in there tomorrow but I, I, I honestly would struggle to see where Ofcom would get involved in, in, in the foreseeable future in terms of license, strict licence commitments. I would think... Um, Ofcom will eventually want to look at what is what is coming out of Edinburgh, because clearly there's going to be a diminution in the the output um, of of news from Edinburgh. We don't quite yet know how that's going to operate. We don't know if there's going to be an opt or some other arrangement. But I would think that would be where Ofcom might want to. So we we are having an evidence session with Ofcom after uh, this evidence session. So. Um, it would be interesting to know if there's anything that you think should be raised with them. I, th I think the Edinburgh opt, for want of a better phrase, is one of the things that you, sh you should ask off come up with. Okay, thank you. Kat, <coughs> I'm afraid we're out of time, so I'd like to close the evidence session now and thank our witnesses for coming to speak to us today. Thank you. I'm keen to keep to time. Yeah. And I'll suspend briefly.
I'd now like to welcome our second panel of witnesses today uh, from Ofcom. Uh, we have Glenn Preston, the Director Scotland, Neil Stock, the Director Broadcast Licensing, and Tony Close, Director of Content Standards Licensing and Enforcement. And you have indicated that you wish to say a few words just explaining your roles to the committee. Yes, thanks, convener. So just a really brief uh, introduction about kind of who you're who you're speaking to. You're probably a bit sick and tired of seeing and hearing from me, to be honest. But uh, as you said, I'm the Scotland director. Um, I have two broad responsibilities. One is to head a small nations team in Scotland that represents Scottish interests within Ofcom on our policy making uh, and regulatory decision taking, and then a broader role to uh, grow and expand the Edinburgh office. As you're aware, we've increased in size over the last couple of years. Uh, we're about mid 30s, hoping to get to. 40 um, by the end of this calendar year, uh, with a mix of uh, different specialisms in the office from economists uh, through consumer enforcement specialists uh, to some of Tony's team actually on the content standard sides and some content policy specialists as well. Morning. Uh, thank you for the invite today. I'm Tony Close. I'm Ofcom's Director of Content Standards, Licensing and Enforcement. My uh, job title might give you a clue to what I do at Ofcom. I oversee the teams that look after broadcast licensing, licensing the 2,000 television and radio services that we regulate at Ofcom. Uh, my team set the standards, they uh, draft the rules in the broadcasting code, and they enforce those standards for all broadcasters that Ofcom regulate. I'm also a member of Ofcom's content board, uh, a largely non-executive committee uh, laid out in statute to advise the main board on content matters and to represent the interests of citizens and consumers. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, good morning, I'm Neil Stock. Uh, I work in Tony's team uh, on the licensing uh, side and uh, I think uh, the main reason I'm here today is my, one of my particular responsibilities is um, local TV uh, licensing and policy. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to start off um, by looking particularly at uh, the impact on news in terms of STV strategic review. We've just heard from the trade unions and the NUG in particular explains uh, the, the uniqueness of, of STV's uh, news provision as effectively a national broadcaster, not just a, a regional broadcaster. And Although STV have said that their review will still maintain their obligations, indeed exceed their obligations in terms of news provision, there clearly is a great deal of concern about uh, the, the future of STV as a national broadcaster. Uh, I wondered if um, you would perhaps explain where you would find it appropriate to intervene in terms of um, their, if, if they weren't meeting their licence obligations. Uh, I'll happily answer, answer this question. Um, as you know, uh, STV have a set of uh, obligations, approximately four hours per week of uh, regional news, uh, a bit, about an hour and a half in uh, current affairs. We expect them, whatever changes that they make at the organisation, we expect them to continue to deliver and even exceed if they want to those obligations. If they failed to deliver against those obligations, that, that's a licence requirement they would be uh, subject to the full array of enforcement action that is available to Ofcom. Uh, we don't anticipate that they'll fail to deliver against those, but obviously we would continue to monitor their compliance with their obligations to make sure that they continue to hit them. Um, the NUG indicated that the current plans uh, for the Edinburgh provision, uh, they thought that was a case for Ofcom to intervene because they're considerably downgrading their Edinburgh provision. Uh, could you help me understand that a bit more? Uh, they're, con they're continuing to perform against their objectives. Um, well, I guess th this is what the NUG believed, that okay. their plans for Edinburgh, which they, they plan to downgrade the provision um, from Edinburgh, they believed was a, a regulatory issue, might be something that you would wish to... I think investigate. We'd, I think we'd probably need to talk to the NUG about what they mean by that, yeah. because the, the question is, are they, are they talking about the uh, provisions in the Edinburgh local licence um, that sits with STV2, which, as we know uh, from the strategic review, is due to be uh, go off air, I think, towards the end of, end of this month, um, or whether we're talking about um, the broader Channel 3 Central and North licences, 
Um, and certainly, I don't think we've had any indication that there's a proposal to kind of come to us and say that they want to change those license conditions or have them relax, particularly in relation to news. So it would be, it would be good to get clarity about which okay. of those two it was. In terms of the bigger picture, um, it's been raised um, uh, by a number of members' concerns that uh, the main shareholder uh, in STV is quite an aggressive, um, active investor, and there has been quite a lot of suggestion, although this is denied by STV, um, that they're being prepared for sale to ITV. If that did happen, what would your role be in terms of the licence? Okay, I think it's important, first of all, to say that we are also unaware of any intelligence that suggests that they're preparing for sale to anyone, including ITV. But if they were to be sold to ITV, we have a role uh, assessing the change of control. We'd undertake a change of control uh, review. As part of that, we would look at the programming commitments and obligations, take a view on whether or not at the point of change of control we wanted to change any of those, as we did when ITV purchased UTV in 2015, where we took that opportunity to bake in uh, tougher, more challenging current affairs commitments for them. There's yes. maybe one additional point worth making there, which um, the committees previously had the exchanges uh, between myself and the Cabinet Secretary for Culture uh, a few, ve few weeks ago, just after the STV uh, strategic review announcement, where um, you know, we, we did flag the fact that the, the kind of broader issue of media plurality, which the Cabinet Secretary asked about, and this committee shown interested in the past as well, uh, is something obviously that we want, to, we want to keep monitoring. We believe there should be a sufficient plurality of providers of TV and radio services across the UK, including in Scotland. Um, and we do have uh, a measurement framework for media plurality, um, so the tools are there for us to do that sort of formal review uh, should those circumstances arise. Yeah. Mr Close, you mentioned UTV. Certainly what we've been told in, in what was widely covered at the time time was that the, the provision fell quite markedly, the news and current affairs provision in new TV fell quite markedly when it was taken over by ITV. Would you apply stricter criteria for Scotland? Uh, I think we'd, we'd apply the criteria laid out in statute. I'm unaware of the uh, reduction or the fall that you're referring to in relation to UTV. UTV has always been well received by its audience and continues to be well received. And at the time of the uh, purchase by ITV, the commitments were enhanced. Well, my understanding is okay. that they, they did drop their current affairs, one of their current affairs programmes. I'm going to go on to Tavish Scott. Thank you. you know, just, just Mr Close, to your point about you've, you've had no intelligence about uh, STV potentially being sold to ITV. None? None. Despite newspaper reports, open comment by lots of interested parties who understand this industry far better than I do, do I you not count that as intelligence? People will always talk about all of the licences that we regulate. And, I think, and ITV have taken over everything else in the country. I think you had Simon Pitts, the chief executive in recently, who indicated that they're not prepping for sale as well. But we weren't necessarily persuaded by his evidence. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you, look, it's of course open to you to take your own view on what STV may or may not be doing. But as far as we're aware, aware and from an official regulatory perspective... Yeah. The official position is, but you recognise there's a lot of discussion about this, open discussion about this. Yeah, yeah. And Mr. Preston, you made the point about plurality. What do you mean by that in the context of STV? Does STV have to remain an independent company? I don't. I don't think it follows that it has to remain an independent company. But it's. Um, I well, think it's it something we would want to. Yeah. Would it be acceptable if ITV took it over? Well, they would still. If in those circumstances, they would still be obligated to deliver the Channel Three license obligations for Central and North of Scotland. Sure. Um, so, you, so we wouldn't be looking at a diminishing of service unless and until somebody came to us to ask to relax it, and that would have to go through the process. As Tony was saying, in relation to UTV, and I appreciate the convener's point about um, you know, one or more current affairs programmes. Uh, coming off air in, in UTV's case, um, we, you know, the, we we don't know that these things are going to happen. We're sort of answering hypotheticals. The, the license obligations exist. They may well choose to enhance of, you know, the, the, the news provision, for example, which takes us to this wider point about plurality. But you recognise that um, you, you're right. Where else are we are dealing with hypotheticals, but the one certainty we know is that the, there is an activist investor who's increased their stake in it, and that activist investor buys companies to sell them. So you recognise you've got. You said you, earlier on you have economists working in the team. Do <laughs> they keep an but eye on the, this kind of thing? Well, they do, they're you know, they're not working on on a hypothetical situation of ITV buying STV. You know, we have to keep an but eye. But don't you scenario plan? 
as part of our as part of our responsibilities as the regulator, you know, we, we need to make sure there's sufficient plurality. Sure. So we pay attention to yeah. the fact that there is news coverage of these sorts of things. I think the convener asked the question of the first yeah. minister in the Scottish Parliament uh, about the potential for sale, and the first minister expressed her concern about it, and so on. So we monitor all of this stuff, yeah. um, but nobody, ITV nor STV, are coming to us to say, you know, this is in the pipeline, you know, and we may have to come to the regulator to talk to them about it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie Green. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, if I could, uh, uh, um, just to clarify, am I, are you okay for me to move on to local licensing issues, or is that? Yes, I think else? that's okay. Fine. Thank you. Um, so you'll be aware uh, the situation regarding STV two and the local television licences. I just wondered if you could first of all open by clarifying what Ofcom's role is in the regulatory uh, monitoring and issuing of these local TV licences indeed in Scotland or, or elsewhere, and uh, what role they will play in any licence transfers, change of controls, or asset transfers? Uh, yes, I'll answer that for you. So um, uh, we, are the, we are responsible for licensing all of local TV in the UK. Uh, there are 34 uh, licences that we've issued, uh, five in Scotland. Um, uh, our responsibilities, uh, once they're licensed, they are licensed a bit like Channel 3 licences with a set of obligations in those licenses which the applicants proposed uh, and we awarded the license on the basis that they would deliver those obligations uh, and so there are five uh, licenses in in scotland uh, stv chose uh, to put them all together into a single service uh, originally they were separate services um, in the event of a change of control uh, in other words someone buying the shares of those companies uh, that our prior consent is not required uh, in other words, that's a commercial deal that can take place. Uh, our role then becomes just to make sure, and this is an ongoing role we have across all broadcasting services, that anyone who holds a broadcasting licence, uh, A, is a not disqualified person. There are specific rules disqualifying certain categories of person from holding licences, uh, and also the more general, broader, fit and proper test around licensees. But uh, someone can buy the shares in an existing company and doesn't require our consent for that. Uh, a license transfer does require our consent, so that's when a license is transferred from the party that currently holds it to a new legal entity. Uh, in those circumstances, uh, it does require our consent, uh, and the law says that uh, we can only withhold our consent if we're not satisfied that the new company would be uh, able to comply with the conditions in the license. So what is happening in Scotland then? Is this a change of control? Is this a... Uh, purchase of shares in an existing entity that holds a license? Is this a license transfer from one entity to another? Or what is, what is your understanding of, of how STV is transferring these local TV licenses to another party? So uh, we have been told by both parties that it's not a license transfer, that That's Media will be buying the shares in the existing companies. And is Ofcom happy with that? It doesn't sound like a very appropriate way to transfer ownership of what is a, a, a broadcast license in effect. Um, are you satisfied that this is uh, not just by the wording of the, the regulatory environment, but in the spirit of the reg regulatory environment, this is the best way to transfer, uh, uh, in effect, the complete operation from one entity to another? Because buying shares in a company is one thing for an investment decision, but actually shifting the whole operation, including the management, the executive, the uh, content decisions, the technical operations, etc. That, to me, sounds more like a, a substantial shift in, in ownership as opposed to just shareholdings moving and, and, and shaking around. So do you not have a view on that or any concerns about that? Uh, we, we don't have a view in the sense of you know, either scenario is open to licensees, and this obviously just doesn't apply to local TV. This applies across all broadcast services. In other words, there is nothing in law uh, that prevents uh, one company that holds a broadcast license selling the shares in their company to a new party. So in other words, we have no power to do anything about that anyway. Uh, you know, it is a, a decision between the parties as to whether they choose to effect the deal, the transaction, by selling shares or <coughs> transferring the license. Clearly, it depends on the situations of the company. You know, it may be that someone who wants to buy a license or buy a company may not want to buy the existing company because it may have a load of debt or whatever the reason is. So. Um, it's not something we can have. A, we are in a position to have a view on because the law allows for both scenarios. In other words, it's entirely up to the parties to choose which scenario they, they go for. However, it's worth saying, uh, in both scenarios, uh, the key things that you know we still have a responsibility for are 
that the license obligations continue to be delivered, whoever holds that license, regardless of whether it's a change of control or a transfer. So in other words, in this particular case, that's media will be continued to be under an obligation to deliver the programming commitments in all five licenses. They, may, they will choose to do that differently to the way that STV did it, but those obligations still exist, and they will have to deliver those. Uh, and as I said, uh, the overarching requirements around disqualified persons and fit and properness still apply. So we have to be notified, we have to run our checks and those sorts of things, but what we can't do is do a detailed analysis uh, of their overall ability to comply, you know, a, a, you know a, an advance uh, assessment of whether they will comply with the conditions. If they don't comply with the conditions, like the Channel 3 discussion before, uh, we have a range of enforcement action we can take if they don't comply with those conditions, uh, and that applies to okay. any licensee. Okay, so I mean, it sounds, it sounds to me, uh, you know, in any other scenario, this sounds a bit like a loophole uh, in, in the status quo here, that, um, that simply by acquiring shares in a business, you can effectively take over the broadcast uh, requirements of it, and, and I'm not entirely convinced that, um, I guess, Ofcom is uh, given this due attention in many respects. Uh, because what we're talking about here is uh, our broadcast licenses uh, uh, and, and uh, the decisions that the new company will make may be very different from the decisions that the existing operator makes. Um, how confident are you that STV has, up until this point, met its obligations as a local license holder, uh, given that it chose to network the licenses uh, and in, in many respects failed to, to deliver on the promises that it made when it acquired those licenses in the first place? So, uh, in terms of delivering the obligations, so uh, each local TV licensee, uh, like Channel 3 licensees, reports annually on whether they've met, they, they are able to deliver their obligations across a calendar year. They report annually on whether they have or not. How they deliver those obligations, the way they choose to deliver those in terms of the way they schedule their programmes is entirely up to them. We don't take a view on that. Um, so, uh, hitherto, uh, we've had no compliance concerns about STV complying with their commitments. We are just now uh, reviewing the reports for 2017 uh, across all local TV licensees. Uh, if anyone is found not to have delivered on their commitments, we will uh, investigate that and potentially take enforcement action. Uh, I can't tell you whether STV have or haven't because we're still in the process of um, reviewing those. Um, but uh, as I say, you know, they are under an obligation to deliver those commitments. Their choice to network was a, a commercial decision that they made on the basis that adding up all of the local programming obligations across all their five licenses, they could still deliver that within a single service. In other words, they didn't come to more hours than there are in a week. And so STV made a commercial decision that it would be okay to uh, have a, a Dundee news service, for example, uh, broadcast across all the five areas they broadcast in, ditto for Air and Aberdeen and Edinburgh and Glasgow. So they chose as a, as a commercial decision, rather than to run separate channels to have a singly, single branded service across all five. As I say, that, that's fine with us because as long as they're in each local area delivering the obligations in those local area, what they do the rest of the time, uh, to a certain extent, as long as it complies with general standards, of course, uh, isn't really a matter of concern. We only enforce what's in their license, which is basically local programming and local news. Would you mind if I just underline one of the points uh, Neil made there? It really is up to the licensees themselves to find the best way of delivering local content to their audiences. And STV picked a particular model that suited them, enabled them to continue to deliver against their commitments, the commitments that we imposed on them in their license, in a really quite difficult commercial environment in, in local TV. I guess just to fin finish off my point, though, I think the concern here, though, is that clearly STV have made a decision that this no longer is working for them for financial reasons or, or, or strategically, uh, and they've decided to offload these, these assets to uh, another operator who admittedly it operates other local TV licenses in other parts of the UK. Um, so I think the concern here, which I'm sure the panel must appreciate, uh, and that's why I'm surprised it hasn't expressed a, a stronger view on this, is the method in which the licenses are being shifted from one company to another. Uh, and I think that's the crux of the matter here, is that uh, this doesn't seem to be going through any uh, uh, due diligence in that respect. Uh, notwithstanding, and it is worth noting, that the 
uh, both directors of STV2 and the new operator sit on the same board of the operating company that runs the local TV network. So, um, you know, what, what greater role should or could Ofcom play in this scenario and these types of deals where uh, one operator decides to renege on its, its commitments to that license and another uh, operator wants to control those licenses? Do you think Ofcom is, has a strong enough uh, regulatory uh, power to, to cope with this scenario which, is, which has arisen? Do you mind if I, I deal with that one briefly? But I we want the best outcome for the audience, for consumers. I think the reason that you're not hearing uh, obvious concern from us is twofold. Uh, one, that this is not an uncommon way of buying assets in commercial entities. Um, it's not, it's not uh, unique to this situation, and it's certainly not unique to broadcasting. And I think the second and perhaps most, most important point is we know that we still have uh, powers to assess the fitness of any new licensee, and we know that there are obligations in place that the new licensee has to meet and has to continue to meet, however they've taken control of the entity. A supplementary from Neil Finlay. Uh, you spoke about the broadcasters reporting to you. How many of those broadcasters, when they report to you, say we have not met our obligation? Uh, well, as I say, for this past year, we, we're still reviewing them, so I can't answer that question. Uh, last year? In, in previous years, nobody has. Ah, shocker. Sorry. Absolute uh, shocker. I'm uh, stunned by that. Can I, uh, can, uh, can I add a gloss to that, actually? And uh, I might be talking <laughs> out of turn, um, but uh, my understanding is, anecdotally, that on this year's, actually a small proportion of licensees have come forward, and we're still running through the numbers, and volunteered that they failed to hit their programming targets, oh, we but we're going through that process. We have a breakthrough. Um, what, um, and, and what sanction do you have? Uh, so we have a range of sanction in relation to any licence condition. Uh, all broadcasters of all types are required to meet the specific conditions of their licence, whether that's number of hours or type of programming or not doing something bad in their, in their content. Uh, if they seriously breach uh, a licence requirement, they go through a statutory sanctions process where we are able to impose a financial penalty, uh, revoke their licence if we think it's the best way of bringing about uh, an outcome for consumers, or try and find other ways of uh, mitigating the failure. And is that, are these powers used regularly? Uh, our sanctioning powers, yes. Uh, they use, uh, we use them fairly frequently. Okay. Um, and uh, do the companies report to you on their profits? Yeah. Uh, no, they don't. Okay. And finally, what is the, um, uh, in your view, uh, uh, has local TV been a success in terms of viewing figures? So I, sorry, shall I, start, shall I start with that one? Uh, so local TV is a, was a, a public policy uh, intervention. I don't think it's our job to decide whether it's been a success or a failure. We have a role to administer it to the best of our abilities. I think it's fair to say, though, that it's been tough financially for local TV. They have and continue to spend much more money than they raise. And I think you can make your own uh, judgment about whether or not that's a picture of success or not. Are viewing figures going in that direction or that direction? I think viewing figures have always been fairly small for local television. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. This answer. So um, uh, I apologise. We, we do collect some financial information from them when we publish it in aggregate annually. We have a report uh, in, in the last two or three years. It was our communications market report, which is a big annual Ofcom report. Uh, this year we're going to be publishing it in a slightly differently badged report, but we, pr we provide aggregate, aggregated information, financial information about local TV's uh, financial performance. Uh, and if you'll have seen the last couple of years communications market reports, they've been fairly stark uh, in making clear the financial challenges that local TV as a whole, the whole sector, uh, has faced uh, effectively since launch. So you don't report on individual companies? We don't report on individual companies. Thank no. you. I think Jamie Green has a supplementary. Thank you for allowing me back in. Uh, just a, 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 perhaps a question for, for Mr. Stock uh, around enforcement. Uh, one of the, um, it's my understanding that one of the local TV licence obligations was the setting up of a local television charitable trust. Uh, and I believe other uh, licence holders in other parts of the UK have, have, have fulfilled that. Is it your understanding 
uh, the STV fulfilled that licence obligation? And if they haven't, is that something that you will look at from an enforcement point of view? Uh, no, STV did. Uh, it's called the Local Television Network, and it's, a, it's effectively a body made up of representatives of all of the uh, local TV licence holders, and uh, STV uh, have been an active member of that body. Uh, but the purpose of the trust, however, was to uh, grow and support and nurture talent. We spend a lot of time in this committee talking about the industry and, and development of, of the industry. Uh, so I'm talking about a, a specific trust with a view to nurturing and developing the Scottish, uh, the Scottish green sector and its talent base. It, is that your understanding of the network that they set up or was this more of a, an informal association of other operators? Uh, the way that the local TV sector set, set it up was more of the latter than, than the former. Um, I think uh, it's fair to say that uh, in the first two or three years of local TV's operation, we've, we've chosen to take a fairly hands-off approach to allow the, the range of local TV licensees to figure out for themselves how they best cooperate together. Uh, you know, they've been set up with the, the, the purpose of uh, promoting the development of local television, whatever that means for them. Uh, we haven't offered views on what they should or shouldn't be doing. They've, they've taken their own views on how best to achieve that, uh, either by lobbying government, lobbying us, or uh, various initiatives. Uh, the Digital Nation uh, initiative, for example, uh, which is a, a program they all run, was something they came up with uh, uh, themselves uh, as a means of uh, you know, better enhancing their, the service they provide to, listen, uh, to viewers. So, um, but we haven't taken a, a, a specific active view on their activities. I'm thinking of you, but uh, can I ask, that, just to clarify, is Ofcom happy that all of the obligations uh, that STV had as a local licence TV holder have been met and that no enforcement is, is due? Uh, in relation to uh, the setting up of the local TV network, yes, we, we have no concerns okay. about Thank you. Thank you. You mentioned earlier, and, um, and Neil Finlay uh, asked you about it as well, uh, that Basically, licences are effectively self-regulated. How do you check the returns to make sure that they're accurate? Do you want to, um, I'll, I'll answer this. Um, uh, so, I, I'll offer a clarification. They, they, they report, they self-report. It's not, it's not self-regulated. Uh, as part of the self-reporting programme this year, uh, we're undertaking a series of spot monitoring initiatives uh, to test whether or not the information that we're being provided by local television services matches what we see on the screen for specific defined periods of time to test whether or not they're telling us the truth. So what proportion are spot monitored? Um, I, I, we're, I, I don't know off the top of my head, actually, no. but I'm happy to, happy to come back to you on that. It's just that you may be aware that this, this yeah. um, committee's done quite a lot of work in, in terms of, in another area of your regulation, which is um, the, the quotas for nations and regions' content. And there has been a lot of unhappiness amongst the independent production sector in particular that these are um, that people are able to misrepresent you know, what is a Scottish uh, production. So that's, um, that's something that people don't have confidence in. So why should they have any more confidence in this process of self-reporting? OK, I, I, I understand the point that you're making, actually. I think that's one of the reasons why we've been so keen this year in particular to structure a spot monitoring programme where we look at the content ourselves as well. Right. Uh, and if we find out uh, that people have been misreporting, then we'll take right. action. So this is something that you've just introduced, the spot monitoring? Yeah. You didn't have it before? No, not in a structured manner anyway. Right, OK. Mm -hmm. Some yeah, people. Can I, can I add one yeah. thing? You, I mean, you, you know this because we've given evidence previously on this, but on um, Made Out of London, um, which is uh, what you were alluding to, that's, I mean, one of the reasons that we are reviewing that, as you're aware, uh, and are expecting to consult in, in early autumn on this, is, is partly because of the process and the issue of transparency and the type of data and information that's provided. So we recognise there's an issue there that needs to be, needs to be looked at. Sure. No, I accept that. It's just, I suppose, some people might say it's a, it's a little bit late <laughs> in terms of local TV here. Um, and just, just finally on the local TV, because I, I think we're moving back to the Channel uh, 3 li licences, um, people on this committee will remember when these licences were, 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 were put out there, and there were alternative bidders in Scotland, and as I recall, um, there was quite a serious alternative bidder which involved uh, local newspaper provision across the country, but obviously STV got the licence. Can you not understand why the people that failed to get the licence, having spent quite a lot of time 
putting the bid together would be extremely disappointed and perhaps would have expected a more robust um, response from Ofcom. I think we, yeah, yeah I, I do understand the I do understand the reaction. This does come up uh, across a range of licensing issues um, where um, those who have been successful who have decided to sell or or relinquish the license are you know the, the the fact is the regulatory framework and the law behind it allows for the commercial process that Mr. Stock was uh, describing, and um, you know that Ofcom has to work within our parameters. We can't we can't do things that the law doesn't allow us to do, uh, and where it's possible for the commercial arrangements to be struck between two parties, uh, that that can happen. So it's it's obviously difficult for us uh, to hypothesise about what might have happened if someone else had got it, but I think it is worth considering this in the broader context of local television and how difficult all successful licensees, uh, license applicants, have found it to continue to run local television and to make any money from it. Thank you. Um, certainly, uh, when you receive complaints from uh, the audience. Uh, regarding the quality of the local news uh, provision uh, in, the, in the Channel 3 areas. What are your actual processes to then investigate these complaints? Uh, uh, okay, so can I unpack that a little bit? So um, it, it kind of depends on what you mean by a complaint about quality. So if people bring complaints to us about the fact that uh, the news isn't sufficiently accurate or robust or it's not impartial, it's not providing the kind of balance that you'd expect from a serious news provider. Uh, we have a formal process for assessing all complaints of that type that we receive. If we think that it raises an issue uh, against the code, a kind of substantive or qualitative issue against the code, we undertake an investigation where we put the allegations or the issues to the broadcaster, give them a chance to explain themselves, and if we're not happy with that, we publicly record a breach against their uh, obligations. If they were continuously or seriously breaching those obligations, again, and we mentioned it before this morning, uh, we would consider uh, taking action against them. Separately, uh, in addition to uh, specific complaints, we do monitor audience attitudes in relation to the quality of the TV and radio that they receive as well. Uh, we have a broad monitoring program and a specific PSB uh, monitoring and tracking program that gives us an insight into what people think about the content that they're receiving, whether or not it meets their needs, whether or not they see themselves or the issues they care about reflected, and whether or not they think it's of good quality. Uh, I should say, look, STV does very well uh, against a lot of those uh, characteristics or parameters. Uh, certainly, in terms of the, the, the other Channel 3 uh, areas within the, within the UK, um, when there has been a, a takeover uh, of, a, of a local uh, provider, um, have you seen a, an increase in, in complaints from the, from the local audiences? Uh, no, I don't think so. No? No. In terms of STV, uh, have you seen a... Uh, has a ha you mentioned a few moments ago that uh, the STV seems to fare uh, pretty well. Yes. But have you, has there been an increase uh, in people complaining about the news output within uh, the STV area? Uh, no, unless someone, unless one of my colleagues wants to tell me otherwise. I don't think so. I think STV continues to perform really well with audiences. It continues to outperform uh, the rest of the uh, Channel 3 UK uh, licensees as a whole. So. Okay. Hmm. Well, that's good to hear. And certainly, hopefully, uh, that will continue uh, going forward uh, after the, uh, any changes actually are introduced. Yeah. In terms of Ofcom, uh, in, in terms of your role to highlight what you do to the uh, to the wider public, um, uh, when uh, when the changes do take place, uh, would yourselves um, try to get uh, can I get your message out to the uh, to the wider public in terms of well, to make them aware of what you do and if people uh, want to, uh, to complain. Uh, would you do something like that to, uh, to have some type of uh, Yes, so ma maybe would you mind if we kind of both an answer this? So any change to one of our licensees that's likely to have a significant impact on the audience or likely to give rise to us making a change to their obligations, we're highly likely to undertake a public consultation before making um, any final decision. And as part of that public consultation, we'll decide what key stakeholders we need to ensure are aware of it, including ordinary members of the public, but also political stakeholders and other key stakeholders. I don't know whether Glenn might want to add. Well, I think, I think there's a couple of things to add. So um, 
you know, in the in the event where we are having to consider those sorts of changes and we're statutorily obligated to consult, mm -hmm. um, the team that I lead will promote that across uh, both industry and, and wider public stakeholders, uh, public institutions, so the Scottish Parliament uh, and other public bodies as well. So we'd expect to be out there talking to people um, about uh, any potential impact that they might have on them. Um, the other thing that Neil allu uh, alluded to earlier is we are uh, we do annually um, produce kind of state of the market reports that highlight things that have happened uh, and Ofcom's role within within those as well. So um, annually we produce the communications market report across uh, TV and radio uh, where we where we produce a Scotland specific report. We're changing the nature of that a little bit this year, um, but the principle behind it is the same. Uh, and over the next few weeks, we'll uh, we expect to publish that. We'll be sharing it with this committee uh, and other Scottish parliamentary committees too. Because there clearly is a, a lot of concern uh, about the proposals uh, and how that's going to affect the news output and the quality of that news output. Uh, so uh, I would hope that your cells are, are not going to be inundated uh, with, uh, with complaints from the, uh, from the general public, but, uh, but there's a possibility that that might end up being the case. I, th I think that that's right. I think it's right. It's a possibility. Um, Tony's already described the processes that we have in place, which I think are pretty robust uh, to be able to deal with that if it happens. Um, I mean, it, it is important to acknowledge, uh, as you saw in your, your own evidence with the STV uh, chief executive and with their, uh, their managing director, Bobby Hayne, that they, they are committing to reinvesting, um, I think it's about £5 million a year, isn't it, over the next three years, uh, to the main Channel 3 uh, licence obligations for Central and North Scotland and to the STV player. Um, so there is, you know, there is, there is that commitment there. STV Productions, for example, seems to, uh, I think, have made more money this year uh, in the first three or four months of this year than it had in the whole of last year. So there are some positive signs here as well, uh, and it is important to recognise recognise that. Okay. Well, thank you. Yeah. Just to pick up on that point, Mr. President, you, when Tavish Scott said earlier that we weren't particularly con convinced by the evidence that we received from the CEO, that commitment to reinvesting, uh, I think we were a bit sceptical given the amount uh, that they're planning to return to their shareholders and have already returned to their shareholders. Clearly that, that element's a matter, a matter for them um, and for them to, you know, to respond to the committee on it. But um, it, I mean, we have to recognise, as we've talked about with the broader uh, context of uh, local TV about its economic viability. Um, and uh, we know that STV2 was loss making. Uh, we know that the audiences watching it were tiny. I think you had some uh, numbers uh, given to you during that evidence session as well. And, and we have recognised this uh, in both our communications market reporting. We've consulted recently, as the committee is aware, on, on not uh, making available other local TV licences because of the concern that we have uh, about the economic viability of the, the sector as a whole. So we, it, it, they're important facts that are, are part of this conversation. Okay. Could, could I add one point in relation to the Channel 3 licence as well? I do want to reiterate, reiterate the point that it, it is within STV's interest to continue to do a great job, particularly on the news provision. They are at 25% audience share compared to 18 or 9% against the rest of the Channel 3 networks, so they are outperforming them. There is a virtuous circle where the better they do as a broadcaster with their audiences, the more they're able to raise revenue. It really is within their interest to continue to make high quality programming for Scottish audiences. Okay, thank you. Mr Stock, earlier in, uh, you, you referred to the, the concept of fit and proper persons in terms of holding licences. Uh, I wondered if you could, you could explain a little bit more about that and, and when, it would, when you would judge whether an, an organisation or an individual wasn't fit and proper to hold a TV licence. Uh, yes, if you don't mind, I'm going to ask my colleague uh, Tony yes. to answer that. Um, uh, Yes, of course. So I've carried out a few of these, um, uh, which is why Neil's uh, referred it across to me. So we have this broad power, both before we award a licence, but also it's a kind of continuous requirement once someone's been issued with a licence, for us to make sure that they remain fit and proper to hold that licence. Uh, statute empowers us to take into account two broad different types of factor. Uh, how they're behaving within the broadcasting sector, so what they've done on screen, um, have they continuously breached uh, obligations that we've imposed on them? Uh, are they uh, run running the risk of uh, seriously harming the audiences? But separately, we're also allowed and in fact required to take into account off-screen behaviour. Other things that this licensee may have done uh, 
uh, in a non-broadcasting arena that might give rise to a kind of uh, an undermining of the integrity of the broadcasting sector if you allowed them to have a license in the first instance or if you uh, let them keep a license uh, once they had had it like uh, uh, confirmed allegations of criminality or uh, demonstrably proving not being able to behave appropriately in another regulated environment. If we had evidence in relation to any of our licensees, it's not specific to this issue, all licensees must be fit and proper, of any broadcast or non-broadcast contraventions of that kind of significance, then we'd undertake an assessment of their fitness because it's a continuous requirement. Mm -hmm. So in terms of Crystal Amber as the largest shareholder in STV and a company that's increasing its shareholding, as, as Tavish Scott had alluded to earlier, I mean, it's regularly referred to as the investor that, that boards fear because it is quite open about its modus operandi is coming in uh, to prepare companies for takeover, nothing to do with public service obligations or quality of broadcasting. Is Crystal Amber fit and proper to hold a TV licence or be the major shareholder in a company holding a TV licence? No, I, I, we haven't assessed Crystal Amber's fitness to hold a TV licence, but based solely on what uh, on the kind of issues that you raise with me now, I genuinely don't believe that a uh, largely or wholly commercial outlook or approach uh, is the kind of factor that legislation envisages when deciding whether or not someone's fit and proper. It doesn't fit with the kind of character of issue, like committing criminal acts, or behaving inappropriately in other regulated environments that I think the high test of not being fit and proper is intended to deal with. Okay. So when, when would you perhaps look at Crystal Amber as to whether they were fit and proper? I think if there was evidence out there that they were acting in a way that genuinely raised concerns of the type that I've just described. Right. So that could be correspondence from concerned people? All people can write to us at any times and tell us yeah. about the owners of our licensees, and we're grateful for all correspondence. But for us to begin or to start to question the fitness of one of our license holders or the major controlling shareholder in that license, that correspondence would have to indicate some significant wrongdoing of some kind that we should be rightly concerned about. Mr. Scott. Thank you, Convener. Just to stop mentioning to the Convener's question there, um, Crystal Amber refused to come in front of this committee. Yeah. Does it, would that be a concern to us, obviously, but would it be a concern to, to you as the regulator? What would they have to hide in not appearing in public in front of a parliamentary committee? Uh, are they obliged to come to the committee? I think that's what I'd ask you. If they are, and they've refused, if they've broken a rule... That's not what I, th I asked. I think I, would be, I think I would be concerned by that. If they've exercised a freedom that's open to them not to come along... I think that that would be so, uh, not, not a relevant factor for considering their fitness. Okay. All right. I'll give up. <laughs> there are many organisations that aren't obliged to come before parliamentary committees, but they do come before parliamentary committees because they, they see the, the value in that. I would see the value in that too. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and <laughs> finally, um, when uh, STV were in front of us, I asked them about the fact that ITV do not have a, a nation's uh, quota, unlike uh, in terms of uh, production, and mm. unlike both the BBC and Channel 4. Is that, could you just confirm that that is something that you'll be considering in your review of the nation's and region's quotas? Um, so I, I, don't, I don't know if I have a, a direct answer to that yet. We are obligated in the next couple of years, uh, I think by... 2020, end of 2020, to do a full public service broadcast review, um, and that will be a wide, a wide-ranging uh, review. Although we haven't agreed what the, the kind of parameters or terms of it, but those sorts of issues, I suspect, would be considered as part of it. Um, but we don't have, you know, as I say, we haven't, we haven't planned what that review looks like. It's a little bit ahead of time yet. Right, but the, cu the current review that you're having into out of London, it wouldn't be included in that then. Even if people came forward no, with suggestions? No, I don't think so. The, I mean, that review doesn't go as wide uh, as, looking, uh, as looking at sort of nation's quota issues, you know, as applied, for example, to the BBC and Channel 4 at the moment, which I know is the, the kind of context in which the committee's been interested about it. It's looking much more specifically, uh, as the committee's aware, about the three criteria, particularly the substantive base one. 
um, and you know those those quite specific issues around transparency and the provision of data and so on. I don't think the intention is that that uh, that review goes widely to to issues like quotas. I see. Certainly, it's something that um, several witnesses have raised with us in okay. our, our report into the screen sector, making yeah. Scotland a screen leader, which has been released today, recommends that ITV uh, should okay. have a nation's quota. And uh, just to convey that to you now. Thank, okay, thank you. Thank we'll, you. We'll, we'll, we'll certainly look at that report. I know it's uh, just been available this morning, so I haven't been able to go through all of it yet. But we'll certainly uh, we'll certainly look at it. Right. Okay, thank you very much, all of you, for coming to give evidence uh, to us today. And we're now going to move into private session.